14 years ago, I walked down Grey Street, St Kilda, ready to start my new job at Sacred Heart Mission. I was certainly had mixed emotions about starting a new job, as anyone does, but I was feeling excited. I knew I was about to start work for an organisation that was making a difference in people's lives. I'd accumulated many years of experience working in the community services sector, and I thought I was ready to take on the complex work of an inner city suburb. St Kilda's an interesting place. It's in the top five most advantaged communities in Victoria, yet it has the second highest rate of homelessness. It's a place of activity, a place where you can touch the sea, a place for recreation and vacation, and it hosts several of Melbourne's big events and festivals. It's an area of sharp social contrast with great wealth and great poverty coexisting in relative harmony or so it seems. For some, living in St Kilda has wakened a sense of social justice, and you can see their compassion in acts of kindness each and every day. But if you scratch the surface, you can also see a community that condemns its disadvantaged members, treating them as invisible, unseen. Back to my walk down Grey Street. It's January 2002, and I've just got off the 96 tram on Fitzroy Street. And turning into Grey Street, I noticed a fight breaking out near a car opposite the Salvation Army. It looks like a drug deal back gone bad, so I give it a wide berth. But I can't help but look over at this group of people and wonder what this job is going to expose me to. I would see this group of people over and over again. They were some of the regular faces who came to the mission for lunch. And in amongst them was a woman I'd come to know well. I'll call her Mary. Mary was then in her mid-30s, although she looked more like 50. She was hostile and angry at the world. She sometimes used violence. She was pretty scary. And the team at the mission didn't know much about her history or her names. Their time and energy was spent on managing the various incidents that occurred when Mary came in for lunch. Being part of management, it was my job to back up the team when the, these incidents occurred, to be the authority of the organisation. There was an incident one day, I could hear yelling and screaming as I approached the area, and there I came in front of Mary. She was yelling at a woman, ordering her to return some money. And all I could do in that moment, in an attempt to calm things down, was to use my authority. It was my first introduction to Mary, and I was asking her to leave, to take her issues away from the mission. And this felt very much at odds with our purpose, which is to help people in need, not to turn them away. There will be dozens of these incidents over the years with the team working hard to contain an outburst from Mary. But we were trapped in this vicious cycle of banning her for violence and then attempting to meet her needs when she did attend. There was an incident one day where Mary had an altercation in the dining hall. She'd broken a glass and was using one of the shards to cut her arm. It was distressing for everyone involved to see Mary harming herself. And after what seemed like hours, she dropped the glass. And as, we were, as, I, as I was providing first aid, I said to Mary, what had happened? And she said, they're not listening. They don't understand. She said a man had assaulted her in the dining hall and no one had cared, no one had stopped it. After being bandaged up, Mary thanked me. She was calm and pleasant. It was like the incident hadn't happened and then she left for the day. These incidents were a common occurrence. Our challenge was to instill boundaries and expectations. For Mary to stop the behaviour, or police or ambulance would be, would be called. And on the occasions when the police or ambulance attended, the situation came challenging and difficult to manage, sometimes taking hours to resolve. I recall an incident one day which spilled out onto Grey Street, with Mary cutting her arms on the steps of the church. The ambulance attended and attempted to assist Mary, but she wouldn't engage with them. And when the police arrived, Mary tore off her clothes and started walking out into traffic naked. The police had no choice. They had to restrain Mary because she was at heart, she was at risk of harming herself or harming others. 
They restrained her and then put her into the back of the police van, naked. It was one of the most upsetting incidents I had witnessed, seeing Mary lose her dignity in such a public way. I know I went home and cried that night. I didn't understand the triggers for Mary's behaviour, why she self-harmed, why she was so aggressive. But I knew she was trapped in this revolving door of homelessness and we were ill-equipped to meet her complex needs. Now, this revolving door comes at a cost, a cost for Mary in not having her needs met, keeping her trapped in misery and exclusion, along with the cost of expensive crisis-driven services, where significant money is spent on a system that is managing, not ending, Mary's homelessness. An Australian study of 11 people experiencing homelessness found that between them, they had cost governments $22 $22 million collectively. That's $2 million per person. One young woman at the age of, who entered the justice system at the age of 12 had racked up $5.5 million by the age of 21 in police time, legal services, housing support and welfare, all contributing to the total. This This cost doesn't trickle down to the person. This is the cost of managing a system. Now, I'm no accountant, clearly, but I can easily tally up that managing the problem, Mary, was costing way more than $2 million. And Mary's story is not an isolated one, with over 100,000 people across Australia experiencing homelessness. We estimate that 22,000 of those are experiencing long-term homelessness. And this is costing governments up to $44 billion. This is the cost of doing business as usual. And we can expect this cost to increase. Homelessness is becoming more prevalent, more visible across Australia. With a shortage of affordable housing, long-term unemployment, mental health issues, substance abuse, failed transitions from state care or prisons, relationship breakdown and family violence, all contributing to people staying stuck in this revolving door of homelessness. This compelling case for change is as clear today as it was a decade ago. We needed to change our approach. And we would do this by developing a relationship with Mary. Over the years, I've been present to many of the incidents involving Mary, and in amongst that chaos, we had developed a rapport. So I would use this to build a relationship with Mary in order to do something different than just manage the problem. Slowly, Mary's story began to unroll. Her life history had been entrenched in trauma. Trauma when she was physically abused by a stepfather and trauma whilst homeless, with Mary being physically and sexually assaulted too many times to count. At the age of 15, she began, she began to sleep rough, sometimes couch surfing, sometimes engaging in street sex work. She was disconnected from her family because she, they simply didn't want to accept or listen to her story of abuse. She had tenuous relationships with many people, but she was always willing to go out of her way to help someone else in need. And I recall one day after an incident at the mission, seeing her lend a woman some money to catch the bus. She had a generous heart. But resolving homelessness is complex, so developing a relationship alone was not going to create a miraculous solution. Incidents with Mary continued to happen, but we were starting to understand what was behind them, what was leading to this harmful way of managing our world. And what we learned was Mary's brain was wired for fight and flight. As a result of the numerous traumatic incidents that she'd experienced, Mary's brain was in constant survival mode. Her ability to manage life stresses, daily challenges, was severely restricted. And as a result, Mary had developed a personality disorder. We learned from Mary why she would slash her arms. This harmful act helped Mary stay connected with her body. Mary often said that when she lost control and lost connection into, with her body, she couldn't stop that spiral into losing control. Cutting her arms 
helped her feel real pain and stay connected with her body. By understanding the complexities of Mary's story, we were able to enlist the support of mental health services, a GP to manage her physical health and eventually get her into housing. And over time, connect her back with her family. These outcomes took time with many false starts along the way. But today, Mary's life is stabilised and on the odd occasion when she comes in for a meal, her visits are pleasant and engaging. A vast contrast to the vicious cycle we were trapped in 14 years ago. Mary's story highlighted the important connection between childhood trauma and long-term homelessness. And if we are to make a difference in someone's life, then understanding this link is crucial. A Melbourne research study of 115 people found that 97% had experienced up to 21 traumatic events in their lives, compared to 4% of the general population who experienced on average four events. These events included rape, sexual assault, physical assault, physical abuse and torture. This research and the work we had done with people like Mary had made it clear that what was required was a program that would not only address a person's homelessness, but also support their recovery from trauma and reconnect them back into community life. Our Journey to Social Inclusion program provides just that. It takes a new approach by providing the level of coordinated and intensive supports that are needed to address a person's multiple and complex needs. It supports people to secure and sustain housing, to manage their health and wellbeing, to participate in the community and become independent as possible, thereby exiting homelessness. Piloted between 2009 and 2012, the program resulted in stabilising people's lives so that after many years of existing in homelessness, they had sustained a home for over four years. Some say it's an expensive model, costing over 60000 per person. But over time, the savings are significant as it stops people from becoming a $2 million statistic. Thank you.